Today we're continuing our series, Peter's Letters to the Church, uh, through, the, uh, through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, we've preached a couple sermons on this. We're going to continue on in, verse two, in chapter 2 today. How many of you remember the game Red Rover? If you remember the game Red Rover, put up your hand. How many of you remember being a team captain for Red Rover? How many of you remember, as a team captain, who did you choose to be on your team in Red Rover? The biggest, baddest dude you could find, right? I mean, you didn't choose the wimpiest guy on the sidelines, did you? You chose the biggest, baddest one, right? I was actually going to have us play Red Rover today, but I decided not to. Well, I was afraid somebody might break a leg or a hip or something, so I decided not to do that. Because there's something that happens in us when we start competing, we will probably get too rough. But it's the idea of being chosen. How many of you remember standing there, looking at the team captains, wondering if they were going to choose you? Or maybe on the playground, all the guys are lining up to play kickball, and two guys are the captains, and then we go through the choosing process. Who's going to be on what team? How that plays out for me. Wanting to be on the team, certain team, but not being chosen to be on that team. I get chosen to be on the other team. If you're following Jesus today, I have great news for you, and the news is this, you have been chosen. Jesus has looked through all eternity, and he chose you. From the beginning of your creation till now, Jesus has always known that you would be chosen. That you are a chosen people. That as followers of Christ, we are chosen. That is not an accident. Somebody say amen. It is not an accident to be chosen. It is an act of the will of Father God that we are chosen. We have not been chosen for our special gifts or our abilities. We have not been chosen because we're stronger or we're bigger or we're badder. We have not been chosen because we have some special thing that only we can bring to the team. We have been chosen simply because we are loved. We are chosen because we are loved. I believe this is a message that the church of Jesus Christ needs to hear. To know that we have been chosen because we are loved, not because of any gift or special ability I have. Somebody say amen. Or anything I can do Is not why I have been chosen. Now, when we're standing on the playground and we're choosing teams for Red Rover, we're choosing the biggest, baddest. Somebody say amen. We're choosing the one that we know can can take a little run and they can find that weak point in that line and they can break the line. Somebody say amen. And then they can go to that other team and choose the biggest and baddest on that team to bring them back to our team. That's not why we were chosen. We were chosen because we are loved. You have been chosen by Jesus Christ because you are loved. I tell people this often and it's, I believe it to be true. If I was the only person in the world, Jesus would have still died for me. 
If you were the only person ever created, Jesus would have still died for you. That, much, that is how much he loves you. He would have went through everything that he went through for you. Peter talks to us today about a chosen people and what a chosen people looks like. What a chosen people sounds like. How they're going to function. We begin in verse chapter uh, 2 of verses 4 through 8 in 1 Peter. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to join me, your iPad, your phone, whatever it is you're using today. Verses 4 through 8. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious... But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and that and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Somebody say amen. First of all, we have been chosen by someone else. Every person in this room has been chosen by Christ. I believe every human in all mankind has been chosen by Christ. But not all people accept Christ. In fact, for some people, the stone, the precious stone, becomes the foundation on which they live, and for others, it becomes the capstone that destroys them. But all mankind has been chosen by Jesus. Sadly, not everybody chooses him. Not everybody chooses to to follow Jesus. And oftentimes the reason they don't is because of what we said, because we are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices. To be chosen by Christ is a life of sacrifice. It's a blessing to be chosen by Christ, but to be chosen by Christ is not always an easy, fantastically wonderful road. But we're being built. Once we accept Christ, we are being built. We are under construction into a spiritual house, into a place where Christ dwells The Spirit dwells in our lives. We are being reparented by Christ. Before we accept Christ, our house is not in order. Once we accept Christ, our house begins to be in order, and now construction goes into place, and we are being built into the house that He wants us to be built into. It does not happen by accident. Nobody does construction by accident. You don't go out and plan construction with no plan. You don't build a house unless you have a foundation. You don't build a house unless you're going to build out of great materials. You don't build a house unless you have a plan. We are under construction to be a priesthood. Somebody say amen. To become a priesthood, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I could stop right there if you wanted. Being built into a holy, royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Somebody say amen. Has anybody in this room received mercy? Have you received grace? 
Were you once in darkness and now living in light? Did you do that on your own? Were you able to accomplish that of your own strength, of your own will, of your own power, of your own way? You were not. You were chosen. And you were loved. You were loved so much that you were chosen to stop living in darkness, to start living in light, to stop living like this world and start living like his world. There was a place of breaking free, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's special possession. Have you ever thought of yourself today as God's special possession? I want you to ponder that for just one second. God's special possession. To be special, even to be possessed by someone as awesome as God is just an amazing thought, is it not? Mary and I, this summer, are going to be married for 35 years, and I, I've decided that the longer you're married, the more special it is. And early on in our married life, it wasn't always fun. Somebody say amen. Many people who get married don't realize that what they're doing is bringing this world and this world, and they're going like this. And there is conflict when that happens. Because this world has a certain way of doing things. This world has a certain way of doing things. And when you try to put the two together, it's like oil and gas. Oil and water. It doesn't mix, does it? It's hard. There's a special possession of being involved with Christ. I have been here. He wants me here. And sometimes it goes like this. And there's conflict. The problem with us in marriage to Christ, which is another sermon I'm going to preach here for too long, the, other, the very idea that, did you understand that you are married to Christ? And so there's a great picture for us to begin to realize that you are married to Jesus Christ. Is that in our marriage to Christ, Jesus always wins. I'm going to say that to you again, just so you understand, that when you are married to Christ, Jesus always wins, because he's the big dog, and I'm not, because he's the king of kings, and I'm not, because he's the Lord of lords, and I'm not, and so he always wins, but he also allows us to choose. He gives us freedom to choose to walk with Him or choose to not to walk with Him. He gives us freedom in every moment of every part of our life to be a royal priesthood or to not. It's amazing to me how oftentimes just following Christ is about choice. It's about my choice. So often, so many times, it's about my choice to follow him because I'm chosen by him, because I'm special to him, because I'm a royal priesthood. I get to live in a royal place. There's a place for me where I'm going to live in the royal palace of the king, a holy nation, a holy group of people that has been transformed by Christ. I don't know how many times I've used the word transformed preaching, but I think it's been a lot. Chosen by someone else. Chosen. God's special possession. A priesthood of believers. Paul actually calls it the, the priesthood of all believers. 
that all believers are part of the priesthood because all believers have been chosen. But every, and everyone gets an opportunity to be chosen. It is a sad thing when people do not choose Jesus because they don't know what they're missing. And they have lots of reasons for that, but they just don't know what they're missing. Lastly, this morning, chosen to be different. And this may be the message that we, the American church, needs to hear more than anything else because I think most of us understand that we have been chosen by grace, we have been chosen by Jesus, that we have been, we're called out of this dark world into living in a light place. Most of us know that. That's the basic tenements, uh, tenements of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I think over years, over the years of the gospel, we have probably missed this one more than anything. We are chosen to be different. Dear friends, Verses 11 and 12, Peter's writing, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Have you ever thought of yourselves as foreigners and exiles? When I I watch television, one of the things I'm becoming more and more appalled at Is how they speak about us. If we are literally foreigners and exiles, I'm especially appalled about how they speak about and characterize Christian men. And how somehow we as Christian men are being labeled as this kind of the weak little wimpy guy that no one would choose for Red Rover. Somebody say amen. The guys that can't lead their homes, they can't lead their families, the wives don't respect them. The children don't respect them. That's the image the world has for us. Especially for us as men. I don't know about you, but that's not who I am. And that's not who I'm going to be in Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. I'm not going to silently go into the corner and put my nose in the corner just because you don't like it. Folks, we are foreigners and exiles in our own country as Christians. We are being portrayed as exiles every day. People who have no value, people who have no opinion, people who do not matter. We live this verse right here, right now, today. If you are following Jesus Christ, you are living this verse. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Somebody say amen. The call for us is to be different, to live differently, to abstain or to separate ourselves from the things of this world, whether you're male or female here today. It is about choosing Christ because Christ has chosen me because I am loved. Peter continues, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, somebody say amen, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. In other words, to be converted. Folks, we are called to be different. 
We are chosen to be different. We are not chosen to live like the world. We are not chosen to function like the world. And here is where we as Christians today, especially today, probably even more so today in our history of our country, need to get a hold of who we are. We have been chosen by Jesus Christ. And because we have been chosen, we have a voice. And our life should matter. And our life should have influence. And our life should have impact. And our life should change situations and scenarios, not just going with the flow. We're called, chosen to be different, to be a light, to help others out of those dark places into the light, to reveal Jesus through our life. To be his, what he's done for us through our life. The mercy we have received is now expelled and shed upon every other person that's around us. Different. I do not wish you to raise your hand here, but how many of us really understand that for the most part, we the church are not living different than the world. Oftentimes we're living so much like them, they can't tell us apart. It's a challenge for us. To walk this kind of life out, to be different. When everybody around me is saying, no, 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 let's go this way. No, be different. What does the Word say? What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? That should be my determining factor on how I live, not what other people or what people say I should do. But if I don't know the Bible, can I do that? I can tell you point blank, if you don't know this Bible, you cannot do that. If you do not read this word, you cannot do that. You will be pulled aside. And the world will win. There are many people, theologians out there today, who are simply saying, to, saying things like, well, it's over for America. America is hopelessly gone astray. There's no chance for America. America is done. You heard that commentary? You know, one of the most amazing things about the Old Testament for me is, is that Father God in the Old Testament allows his people to choose whatever course they want to choose. Somebody say amen. Even when it's against what he wants them to do. Can we agree to that for just a second? Everybody say yes. And then what does God do? He will let them go so far, and then what will he do? He will do something to get them to come back, won't he? You know why? Because we're chosen. Because those were his chosen people. He wasn't going to just let them go. He was going to do something so that they would come back. And we are in the same boat when it sounds like everything is falling apart, God's going to show up. And then we will have to choose him. There's some amazing scriptures in the Old Testament where the people of God actually fall on their face in repentance for what they've done and they come back to God. Somebody say amen. I, I invite you to go read that. And begin to pray that over this country. Especially begin to pray that over the church. Because I believe judgment will begin in the house of God. It will start with us. 
It will start with us. It will begin with me or with you or whomever. Chosen first by someone else. We have been chosen. Do you know that you have been chosen today? That the Lord Jesus chose you. He called your name. He chose you out of that pit. He chose you out of that situation. He chose you. And then he applied his blood to you. If you do not know that you're chosen today, the Jesus we worship and the Jesus I'm telling you about today is waiting here for you, open-armed, to simply allow you to walk into his arms and receive him fully and completely. But you must choose him. You must choose him. And you must choose him not just with some of my life or part of my life or a little bit of my life or the part I want him to have or the part I don't. I have to choose him with everything, fully and completely. I have to give him my whole life. And then at that moment, he will begin to do construction in me. Somebody say amen. He will begin to construct something in me, a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a holy nation. He will begin to choose that construction inside of me. Chosen as a priesthood to be an example, chosen to be different. Are you living a different life? When people see you, do they say, that guy, that person's following Jesus? Or do they have question marks? Well, maybe, I'm not sure. I thought he was, but according to that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether he's following Jesus. I thought he was one of those people, but I don't know. When they see you, do they see Jesus? When they hear you, do they hear Jesus? Chosen. Different. How many of you know that we don't like to be different? Somebody say amen. It's a whole lot more comfortable for us to be in a room of people where we're all kind of the same, isn't it? It's no threat, no conflict, no problems. I can just kind of slide through chosen just like in the Old Testament when God chose his people the Jewish people do you know that today even the Jewish people are still known as the chosen people even when we read in Revelation we understand that they are the chosen people somebody say amen That's why you should be praying for the nation of Israel. Because the judgment will absolutely begin with them. Somebody say amen. We are Gentiles, but we're still chosen. Chosen. For what? Chosen for what? I submit to you today that we have been chosen to love Jesus Christ as much as he has loved us. We have been chosen to serve him the way he has served us. We have been chosen to follow him, to submit to him, to get on our knees before him and allow him to be Lord and Savior, King of Kings, Alpha and Omega of my life. In whatever form, in whatever way, He chooses to take me. That's chosen. Mary and I went to see the movie Risen last night. I would invite you to go see the movie because it's a very powerful movie and it's created from a very interesting perspective. Are you chosen? Have you been chosen? How does it feel for you to be chosen? And is your chosen lifestyle having an impact?
Is it having an impact? If you have been chosen, is it having an impact? I invite you to bow your heads this morning as the worship team comes. And I haven't done this for a long time, but I invite you today, if you, do know, if you know today in this room that you are not following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, I invite you right now with every head down, every eye closed, everybody's eyes are closed. No one looking around. This is a safe place. I invite you to answer the question, have you, have you been chosen? Are you following Christ today? If you are not following Christ today, and you know right now Sitting here in this room, the Holy Spirit is already speaking, and you know right now that you are not following Christ. You may have even believed you're following Christ for a long time, but you're, you now understand that your lifestyle and the way you have been following Christ is not really following Christ. And you want to do something different today. You want to choose Jesus. Because I promise you, His arms are wide open, welcoming you, ready for you today. You must choose to walk into His arms. You must choose Jesus. Even though you have been chosen, you must also choose Him. So I invite you today, if you know that you need to walk into Jesus' arms right here this morning, to raise your hand. Simply raise your hand. Amen. I thank you for the courage that it just took for you to raise that hand. That may have been the most courageous thing you'll ever do is to raise your hand and to mech- and recognize and to admit today that you know that you're not following Christ. For those of you who raised your hands this morning, I invite you to walk into his arms. And that may be to simply as, as the music begins today and as the Lord leads you, I invite you to come forward and receive Christ. But I'm not going to force you to do that. The choice becomes yours. You choose Jesus today. You choose to follow Jesus today. I can't choose that for you. No one in this room can choose it for you. But now knowing the truth, you must choose. The rest of us have said that we know Jesus. Jesus is a part of our life. We are following Jesus. By not raising our hands, we have said that we are following Jesus that we have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives. We have submitted to Him. We have humbly laid before His feet. And He is now Lord and Savior of my life. I ask you one simple question. Does your life reflect difference or is it the same as it was before? Are you different because of Jesus? Are you living a royal priesthood? Are you living out a holy nation? Is your life having an impact for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Does this describe you? Are you standing on the stone, the cornerstone of Jesus Christ? Or has that stone crushed you? Crushed you? Because you have been disobedient. Because you have not really followed him. In fact, what you have said over and over and over again is, Jesus, I love you, but don't ask me to do that. I can't do that. I won't do that. I'm not going to do that. Not now, Jesus. Maybe later, Jesus. Not now. Maybe later. And the Spirit of the Lord is sitting here in this room today, and He is speaking to your heart. And maybe like the people of Israel who finally came to that place of understanding that they were not following Jesus the way he wanted them to. They were not following the God that they were called to follow. And they recognized, they came to a moment and a place of recognition. And in that recognition, there was repentance. And then when there was repentance, there was humility. And then there was a crying out to God that I would just turn my heart and follow him. No matter what it might cost me. No matter how it may play out for me. No matter what situation or scenario I might have to give up. I'm just going to follow Jesus. Because He chose me. Because He loves me. 
And because I love Him, I'm just going to follow Him. I'm going to lay everything else aside. And I'm just going to follow Him. I'm going to let Him start construction in my life. If that's you today, then I invite you to respond to the Lord as you need to respond. If you want someone to pray with you in this room, I invite you to go get that person and have them pray with you. But I, with all of my heart, invite you today to not just be chosen, but to live chosen. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for Peter, the man who probably understood this more than any other man in all of life, who walked face to face with you, hand to hand with you, and in every moment of every day that he walked with you, you crucified his flesh time and time and time again. And then you came to a point of just turning it all, putting it all in his hands. And the grace and the mercy that you gave Peter over and over and over again is now available to us here in this place. But there's a point and a place for every man where we must choose to follow Jesus. We must choose because we have been chosen. We must choose because we have been chosen. And no longer will life at the norm be okay. It will start to taste bad. It will not be what He wants. I pray, Lord, that You would, through Your Holy Spirit, minister into each life, give us the courage to do what we need to do here in this room today. I thank You, Jesus, for Your love, for Your mercy, for choosing us. For choosing us. We worship You in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said, Amen. If you want to accept Jesus today, I invite you over here to my right, your left. If you want someone to pray with you today, I invite you to go get that person and do what you need to do.